Good morning and welcome to St. Paul's Lutheran Church here in Burlington, North Carolina on the 19th Sunday after Pentecost. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord God, tireless guardian of your people, you are always ready to hear our cries. Teach us to rely day and night on your care. Inspire us to seek your enduring justice for all the suffering world. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading is from Genesis. The same night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maids and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The appointed psalm is Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where is my help to come? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved and he who watches over you will not fall asleep. Behold, he who keeps watch over Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand, so that the sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. It is he who shall keep you safe. The Lord shall watch over your going out and your coming in from this time forth forevermore. The second reading is from 2 Timothy. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inscribed by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I solemnly urge you, proclaim the message. Be persistent whether the time is favorable or unfavorable. Convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience in teaching. For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. As for you, always be sober, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, carry out your ministry fully. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 18th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, 
In a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city, there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, Grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice, so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. There's an old expression that says, grab the bull by the horns. Grab the bull by the horns. You've heard it. It's probably rooted in the Old West in which cowboys and ranchers engaged in wrestling with bulls and, and uh, by holding on to them by the horns. And in some cases, it may have been a form of entertainment, but it was also just a part of daily life and work to grab the bull by the horns and make it do what you needed. Of course, the expression has been adapted to refer to any situation in which there is some struggle to overcome, or when the only way to even get through a thing is just to get in there and grab the bull by the horns. You, you get a hold of them and you don't let go. I mean, it means that you simply must persevere and persist through this thing. In the modern world, of course, we now hear this same phrase amended even a little further to get closer to what we actually mean by swapping out the word bull and saying, take life by the horns. That is, we recognize the struggles of life. We know that it is sometimes quite the wrestling match. There are some days when even the most simple task that, that should have taken five minutes just falls apart and it becomes an hours to maybe even weeks long endeavor. And I find myself all the time thinking when these things happen, why does everything have to be such a chore? So rather than grabbing the bull by the horns, I often feel that I spend quite a lot of time trying to avoid the bull altogether. And so I'm always impressed by those who are able to do it by jumping in there and grabbing that bull by the horns. I mean, over the past few months, I've really been encouraged by the Ukrainian people who have been so persistent in rising to the challenge to rise up and grab their Russian aggressors by the horns. Well, the image of persistence and perseverance is certainly upheld by today's appointed readings for the 19th Sunday after Pentecost. Jesus instructs his listeners in Luke's gospel about the need to pray always, to be persistent, and he speaks of God's readiness to hear and answer all those prayers. In the second letter to the apostle Timothy, Timothy is instructed to continue to be persistent in what he has learned, to continue uh, to use the sacred scriptures and writings for teaching, and largely he is encouraged to be persistent in proclaiming the gospel message whether the current time is favorable or unfavorable. Just be persistent, regardless of how the message is being received. But it is the image of persistence that we have before us this morning in the Old Testament reading from Genesis that perhaps seems a little more strange. As it comes, 
in the form of an old-fashioned wrestling match between Jacob and what is revealed to be an incarnation of God. And I think that's more of an awkward image for us to think about. I mean, wrestling as an Olympic sport, a classic sport, is a contest of strength. It's like grabbing the bull by the horns. In the same way, you want to grab a hold of your opponent so that you may manipulate their position to get them to where you need to score the points and win the match. And really, that does not seem to be the way that we would want to describe our relationship with God. And yet, here is an incarnation of God wrestling with Jacob. And the Hebrew word for wrestle can also mean to get dusty. So here's God rolling around in the dirt with Jacob down by the river. Now, in the context of Jacob's whole story, we probably shouldn't expect this encounter with the mysterious night visitor to go any differently than it does. And after all, Jacob had been wrestling and struggling with anyone and everyone from his birth, even before it, really. I mean, his story begins by quarreling with his twin brother Esau in the womb. And Jacob is the second of the twins to be born, but he's born grabbing on to the heel of his brother Esau. And his name, Jacob, Yaakov, actually means heel grabber. Later, Jacob would swindle Esau to trade him his birthright for a pot of soup. Then, with his mother urging him on, he steals the firstborn blessing from his father Isaac by pretending to be Esau. After this, he sets out to go and live with his uncle Laban, and he wrestles with his uncle Laban figuratively for years concerning wives and livestock and goats and flocks. And then we move further on to today's text. And Jacob at long last is returning home with all the family and flocks that he has accumulated. But he's wary about going home and meeting Esau there. Surely he worries that Esau will go on the offense and that there will be a struggle, a wrestling match, if you will, between them. And so he sends everyone on ahead of himself, and he stays behind. And it's there that we see Jacob still wrestling against everybody and everything, and really expecting nothing else out of life. Well, I think it is no surprise then to find that when he gets into a physical wrestling match that night, he gets a good hold on his opponent, of course, not knowing at the time that he wrestles with God, and he refuses to let go. He's persistent. He's grabbed that bull by the horns, and he will not let go. He even persists and powers through an injury, saying, I will not let you go unless you bless me. This is all Jacob just being Jacob. But since Jacob's wrestling opponent is revealed to be the Lord God, it creates some interesting paradoxes on both sides of this encounter. On Jacob's side, we see here that he's, by his wrestling and refusing to let go, he is both wrestling with God and also clinging to God. Even if he doesn't fully understand that this is what's happening. In a manner, it's representative of his whole life, wrestling against and clinging to, and yet this encounter will change him. He will receive a blessing. He will receive a new name that solidifies his place in the story of God and his people. But there are also some interesting paradoxes on God's side of this wrestling match. Here we glimpse a God who can be seen as an opponent and also as a friend. We see a God who assaults 
yet also grants grace and mercy and blessings. Now, I admit that I'm not too keen on the idea of our God as one who comes after us with an assault. And I'm always uncomfortable to think that Jacob has won this wrestling match and has somehow overpowered God. But by wrestling with God and clinging to God and refusing to let go, he gets what he asked for. It seems he has won the day. But the more I think about that, the more I think we should not be fooled into t to thinking that this is not what God was after in this assault to begin with. God would have Jacob cling so tightly to him in this way. God would have Jacob ask those good things of him in order that he might transform Jacob into the man he was called to be. What we see here then is that God will achieve his own purposes even in struggles against him. We can also see here that God is sometimes for us precisely by standing against us. I mean, after all, in human sin, we all struggle and wrestle against God. But God fights back as a parent would against a rebellious child because the parent has the child's best interest at heart and mind. It is God's project in this struggle to strive with us sinners and transform us. It's the work of our baptism, after all, that daily the old sinner within us is drowned and we are given a new name, child of God. Observing all of this, then, it gives even more power and meaning when Jacob names the place that he had wrestled with God, Peniel, it's uh, the face of God. Jacob says, I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. And again, preserved is a bit weak. Uh, the Hebrew word there also means delivered, rescued, and saved. In other words, his life is not just preserved. He didn't just manage to survive this encounter with God, but God has done something specific in his life. He has delivered him and saved him. In a commentary on Genesis, theologian and author Rusty Reno writes the following, Out of necessity, God's holiness overwhelms us and undoes fallen humanity. But at the same time, God allies himself with his elect in order to secure safe passage through the fires of judgment. This reaches its climax in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In Christ, God becomes the one who stands in the middle of this great wrestling match to repair the breach. In Christ, we also see God face to face so that as we wrestle and contend because of sin, we might also cling to him and ask for his blessings and receive them from his grace and mercy. Perhaps the Lord does operate with us often by what feels like a great wrestling match. And surely the Lord does so in order to condition us for persistence and perseverance in the life of faith. We are born into a broken creation that causes us to struggle daily. We contend with sin and the devil, with hardships, infirmity, and illness. We contend with each other over race and clan and creed and politics. We wrestle and contend with our God as we sometimes resist being gathered together as his children or doing the ministry that we have been called to do. And yes, we wrestle with and cling to God in our prayers as we ask for his blessings, as we long for those desires of our hearts, as we sometimes turn to him seeking understanding about 
the life and the world and everything. Just as the widow in Luke's gospel this morning takes the bull by the horns and is persistent in her pleading of their case against with the unjust judge and is at last rewarded because of such persistence, Jesus would have us to be so persistent in prayer as we cling tightly to him. For if the unjust judge of that parable who describes himself as having no fear of God or respect for anyone at last gives in to the persistence of the widow, then how much more can we expect from our Lord who desires that we should ask blessings of him, who desires to give those good things to us? Like Jacob then, we take the bull, life, whatever comes by the horns, and we struggle. We enter into that struggle. We struggle with God. We struggle with each other. We struggle and wrestle with so many things. And like Jacob, we prevail. But we prevail not due to our own strength or our own ability to somehow overpower our Lord and get what we want. We prevail because within the struggle, within that great wrestling match, we are also clinging tightly to our Lord in faith. We cling to the one who gives us the victory and saves our life. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.